I'm just so honored to be with you this morning and share God's word and, uh, and really thankful to Pastor Ben for the opportunity to just share what's on my heart with you. Uh, and so I also just want to say good morning to all those who are watching online as well. Can we give it up for our online congregation, online campus? As a church, uh, our vision, what we're all about, what we see happening is to impact Calgary and the whole world with the life-transforming presence of Jesus. And man, we are on the move. God is on the move, I should say, rather, through us. And uh, it's just been amazing, such an encouraging time of growth. Um, Not that it's ever about the numbers of people in our chairs or watching online, the statistics, Um, but it has been and always will be about seeing people set free and transformed by the presence of Jesus, amen? And so we just ask the Lord continually, would you do it again and again and again? I'm really, really thankful. Hey, um, can I get you to do me a huge favor? Just open your Bibles to John chapter 5. We're going to read from it in just a moment. Whoa, whoa, spoilers, okay? Hold on, okay. Flip your Bibles there. Um, while, you're, while you're doing that, I just want to remind you that we are in a series called Miracle in the Making. Turn to your neighbor say, Miracle, miracle. In, the in the Making. Come on, now it's locked in. You'll never forget that, I'm sure. John chapter 5. Here, we're going to read God's word together, okay? Well, actually, this was hard last service. I'll read God's word. You read it in your minds, okay? Sound good? Sounds good. Here we go, John chapter 5, verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals, Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of people used to lie, the the sick, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years, 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for such a long time, he went to the man and asked him, do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? Sir, the man replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me before I get there. And Jesus says to the man, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. This morning, if you are taking notes, the title of our message is First Come, First Served. Can we pray together as we observe God's word? Jesus, this morning... I ask that you would speak to the depths of our heart. God, I'm thankful for your word. And as we look at this story of this man, I ask, Holy Spirit, would you comfort us? Would you guide us? Would you give us peace? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you didn't hear me before, I, and I do not use this word lightly, hate waiting. Is anybody else impatient in this room? Come on, be honest, shame the devil, tell the truth, it's okay. It's all right. We're human. We don't like waiting for things. Even more so in the day and age we live in, I don't like waiting for things. I bought Amazon Prime for a reason, same day delivery. What do you mean I have to wait a week? I don't care if it's a long weekend. This is what I'm paying for. The doctor's office. Listen, God bless you if you work in the medical field. If you are a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're any type of medical staff, God bless you. I love you. This isn't about you. It's not about you. There's a reason I don't go to the doctor very often. It's not because I don't like to. It's not because I'm uncomfortable. I don't like to wait. I do not like to wait. 
Stub my toe? No way I'm going to the walk-in clinic. Uh-uh. Why would I? That would be crazy. I've had a, la- a, loss- a, whoa, a lasting cough for like 17 weeks. I don't need to get that checked out. No problem. Annual checkup? Uh-uh. No way. I'll just Google that. That's what the internet's for. No lineups online. Am I, mar- am I right? Amen? I go to the doctor, just so you know. In case you're wondering. And you should too. Amen. Let's wrap up. Okay. I don't like waiting. But I'll say this. I think of myself, and Mandy, maybe you can agree. I think that I'm a pretty patient person when it comes to other people in my life. Sometimes. I don't know why I asked you. You're probably going to say no. I think I am, or at least I was, until I had kids. (laughs) Parents, where are you? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Listen, there's... I'm not a morning person, okay? But I really do enjoy a nice, slow morning. Like, I'll wake up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. if it means I can just relax and take it easy, make a nice, fresh pour-over, open my Bible, invite the presence of God into my day, light a candle, (laughs) pray over my children and my wife, and clean up my house and just sit and... Read the news. I don't know. Just like if that's my morning, oh my gosh, I could get up at any time. But it's back to school season. And as soon as 7.30, 7.45 hits, a, a switch gets flipped. And I'm like a drill sergeant. I'm like, Judah, like you got to go, man. What do you mean you're still in your PJs? We got to go, 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 go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Hustle, 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 hustle. Sage, you're three. Come on. You should know how to dress yourself by now. This is crazy. Like, what are, you, what are you trying to do to me right now? This is nuts. And then we're getting into the car, and he's, 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 he's turning six in October. He's putting on his seatbelt. And I'm like, no, no, we don't got time for that. Let's just go. Forget the seatbelt. Come on. No. <laughs> My kids wear seatbelts. Don't call anyone. <laughs> I don't like waiting. But I'll tell you this, as long as I've ever had to wait for anything, I don't think I've ever had to wait as long as the man in this story. 38 years, he's not waiting for like some Amazon dupe Birkenstock shoes on, you know, to come in the mail. It's not what he's waiting for. It says in this story that when Jesus finds this guy, he, he can't even make it to the pool. This like supernatural or pseudo supernatural pool that apparently heals people. He can't even make it down. There's no one to help him in. And even worse, if he does manage to make it to the water, somehow somebody gets there first. Because this pool is first come, first serve. 38 years. See, the people in this story, when Jesus enters Jerusalem and he goes to the pool of Bethesda, it says there's a great number of people there. We don't know how many exactly, but it's a large crowd. Could be hundreds, could be thousands. A number of people sick. And these people who are there, including our, our, our stranger that we encounter here who's healed, they are trapped in their brokenness. Waiting, stuck, hoping for their opportunity to get to the water at the right time before anybody else gets there. They're trapped. They're waiting for a touch of mercy in a system of first come, first served. I wonder if you're here or watching online this morning, if you have ever found yourself in a long season of suffering or waiting, or maybe you're in that season right now. 
And if you're honest, when you hear the series Miracle in the Making or the album or anything like that, you're like, oh, oh man, I'm waiting for mine. I want you to be encouraged this morning. Before we move on any further, there's one thing that I want you to remember above all other things that come out of my mouth this morning. If anything I share with you takes root in your heart at all, if any seeds are planted, if you ingest any part of this morning, if you leave here remembering anything at all, I want you to remember this, that that is not the way our God operates. He is not operating on a first come, first serve basis. That's not him. The kingdom of God is fueled by grace and mercy and compassionate love. It's not take a number. I'll be with you in a moment. And I get frustrated at times because there's versions of Christianity that get twisted and, and we're sold a lie that like if we just had more faith, if we just maybe tithed a little bit more or if we just mustered up a little bit more strength in these seasons of str- suffering and struggle that God would then touch our lives. And if you are here this morning or if you're watching online and you've ever been told, oh man, I'm, mm. if you've ever been told the lie, that God's healing or his mercy or his love is conditional to what you can offer him. It's not true. And there are people who have been hurt by that. It breaks my heart. The kingdom of God is not first come, first served. It's Jesus saying, I have come to serve. I'm here to serve. It's not about getting there first and quickest. It's about God coming to us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. The miracles, the healing, the touch of God that we're waiting on, those things are not dependent on our ability to get to the waters fast and first. Amen? It's dependent on God who has mercy and everlasting love for us. God sees you, First Assembly, right where you are. And he is filled with compassionate love for you. Remember that. If you forget anything, everything else, who cares? Remember that. Sound good? Sounds good. So when we come upon this story in John chapter five, as followers of Jesus, there's three elements that I am drawn to that I think we need to pay attention to, maybe be challenged by or encouraged by. And and these three elements, I call them the the where, the wait, and the want. Let's let's say it together, okay, for our memory's sake. The where, Where? the wait, Wait. and the the want. Cool. So first up, The where. Turn to your neighbor, say, the where. Now you'll never forget, right? (laughs) Imagine if we did a pop quiz. Quick, what was the the title of last week's sermon? (laughs) Woo! Exactly, exactly. Allison, I'm with you. I'm with you. So the where matters. The, the scene that we are being uh, given by John matters a lot. The setting of our miracle by the pool is important. First of all, it says that Jesus uh, comes to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, and it says that this pool is located near the Sheep Gate, which if you're unfamiliar, uh, Nehemiah and his crew, when they rebuilt the temple, they built the Sheep Gate, and this primary, the primary purpose of this entrance was to actually lead animals, particularly sheep, to the temple to be offered as a sin sacrifice. Interesting. And here we have Jesus coming through the same gate. And I don't have time this morning to get into why that's important. But I think John is trying to turn our attention to who Jesus really is, that he is the lamb that was slain for our sake that it is in him we should put our hope and our trust for our ultimate healing. Amen? Amen. You with me? Okay, good. 
Now, we aren't told, like I said, we're not told how many people are there at the pool waiting, but we know that it is a great number, a large crowd. Even the stories of the fish and the loaves were given a little bit of a number, a picture of how many people, but here it's so many, perhaps maybe too many to count. And Jesus is on his way to celebrate this Jewish festival, this feast. So the question I have for myself as I'm reading this is why stop here? Why now? If you're familiar with the story of Jesus, he is very interruptible. And he may be headed towards a destination, but he is certainly willing to stop along his journey for those who are broken. Matthew Henry, a theologian, says this. We're going to throw the quote up on the screen. He says this. Observe, when Christ came up to Jerusalem, he visited not the palaces, but the hospitals. Not places of importance, but places where sick people are, which this is an instance of his humility and condescension and tender compassion. This is an indication of his great design, his sole purpose in coming into the world, which was this, to seek and save the sick and wounded, the lost and the broken. Amen. If you are familiar with uh, my family's story, Mandy and I, um, we have three amazing kids. They are the best. Uh, They're incredibly tall. I wonder why. (laughs) When my son Judah was born, he's six now, by the way. He's going into grade one. It's crazy. Blink, parents, am I right? And then, I'm going to be a grandpa. It's going to be great. Can't wait. But I remember uh, in 2018, Jude was born October 30th, and about a week after he was born, parenthood is hard. Amen? Uh, my son got really, really sick, like really sick, and he, uh, he contracted bacterial meningitis. Oh. Yeah, it's a toughie. I'll spoil the ending, obviously. He's in grade one. He's great. He's doing well. Wants to play basketball. Um, Really likes sharks. It's great. (laughs) Typically, if you have a serious infection that requires you to go to the hospital, typically, the doctors told us, it's like a three and a half week process where you get antibiotics, you clear go home. You're good to go. Three weeks is a long time. But for some reason, his infection just kept sticking around. And three and a half weeks turned into three and a half months. It was hard. Now, it's not 38 years, but it's a long time. It's a long time. I don't know if you've ever stayed with uh, family members at the children's hospital, but they don't have beds for parents. You're just laying on a bench. (laughs) It's not comfortable. And not when you're six foot six, not a chance. And despite what they encouraged us to do to go home, Mandy and I slept there for three and a half months. We ate there. It was a hard time. I tell you this story Because we were surprised by the people who came to visit us. Of course, our family and friends did, and a lot of people at our last church uh, came and visited us. But there was one couple that surprised us a lot. It was our own pastors of this church, Ben and Heather, who showed up for us very soon after we were in the hospital. They, They caught word of our situation. And I want to shout them out for a moment. I think Heather's in kids' ministry right now, and Ben's away on ministries. But I want to shout out our senior pastors because they didn't need to do that. I wasn't working here. I didn't go to First Assembly. We were just some punk youth pastors on the other side of town. There's no reason for them to come. There's no obligation. 
except that's where Jesus would be. So before we move on, can we just, just celebrate our pastors and who they are? Let's just, yeah. They were there because Jesus would have been there, and he was there. It's not to the palaces that Jesus goes to, it's the hospital rooms. It's the waiting rooms. It's the dark alleys. It's the funeral services. It's the job interviews, the 10th one, holding out hope. It's the long-term care facilities. Jesus is there. And I, I highlight the where of this story, the setting, because I think it's an important reminder to us who follow him that we need to quite literally follow him into those places. Amen? Like, apart from that, Hospitals, yes, doctors, nurses, medical staff, they're amazing. And if you're here and you are in that field, I love you so much. Thank you for serving my family and many others. But we have a call on our lives, First Assembly, to go where Jesus went and to do what he did. When's the last time you went to a hospital for somebody you didn't know? When's the last time you just showed up? You probably can't knock on a door anymore. I don't, they're, not, they're too big, but. Hi, I'm Hunter. Listen, I'm a pastor or I'm a follower of Christ. Is there anyone here who, who needs prayer? Maybe a nurse who's been on a crazy 12-hour shift. You need some prayer? Can I pray with you? We need to bring light into dark places again. First assembly as much as it is tempting to do the opposite. That is the where. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, the wait. The wait. Come on, the wait. So here's what we know. There were many, many, many people waiting for their moment in the pool of Bethesda. But this man had been there for 38 years. Now, I don't know if he'd been there the longest, but 38 years is a lifetime. And if you're an ancient Near East person, back then, it's quite literally a lifetime. You might not live much past 40. That's so tragic, it's so painful. And I, I have to imagine that this man probably lost hope in his situation. After years and years of watching other people who show up after him leave before him, who just so happen to have enough friends surrounding them to bring them to the pool, or who just so happen to, to make it there first, how disheartening that would be, how hard that would be. I don't know anyone who would be strong enough to endure a season and come out on top like that. And so Jesus, by the time he gets there, 38 years of this, he asks him if he wants to get better. And you can see in the text how the hope of this man has failed. Because he doesn't even say yes. Of course he wants to be healed. But instead of saying yes, or in some other stories where people encounter Jesus, yes, if you're willing, like, please heal he doesn't say that. He just tells Jesus what's going on. It's like this complaint slash explanation. He'd probably given up. Church, seasons of patience, they can be really painful at times. For me, three and a half months, a long time to endure pain and hardship and suffering. And I know that there are people here, people watching online, who are going through suffering way longer, who are waiting on prayers to be answered. And if we're honest, it's hard to keep praying for something if you don't see it happen. God, why haven't you healed my dad? Please heal him. It's been years, God. 
Lord, my daughter, she'd been sick since she was born. I just need you to touch her life. Lord, if I don't find a job soon, things are going to get bad real quick. I need this. Seasons of patience are painful, but they do have purpose. And that's not to say that God orchestrates them, but he is sovereign and powerful to use those seasons that were designed for evil and bend them for good. Isaiah 40 says this, do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. I wanna invite you, if you're here this morning and you need to hear these words, to just close your eyes, just to bow your heads maybe, and just receive what God is saying through his word. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths will grow tired and weary. Even young men will stumble and fall, but those who hope in, or some translations, wait upon the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar and run and not grow weary or faint. He is the everlasting God. So perhaps you've been waiting for a long time for circumstances to change, for something to be healed, for internal, external, whatever the case may be, for God to move in your life. I wanna encourage you not to give up hope. Will we always receive God's healing in our life? The miracle that we're hoping for, will he always remove the, the, the thorn in our flesh? I don't know. It's too complicated to answer on stage. But I do know this. The power of God works best in our weakness. And his grace is sufficient for us. So hope in the Lord, not what he can give you, but him. And he will renew your strength in a season of waiting. Amen. I want to invite up uh, our, our worship team or the keys player, whoever's coming. The last point here, turn to your neighbor, say the want. The want. This is perhaps one of the most strange interactions between Jesus and someone who is sick. It's a very strange one. This man is, like we've been talking about all morning, he's been sick, he's been in this state for 38 years, tormented by his circumstances. And Jesus shows up on the scene and has the audacity to ask him, hey man, you wanna be healed? Remember, this is Jesus asking. Like, this isn't just some Joe Schmo, it's Jesus the God who can discern hearts and minds of both crowds and Pharisees alike, who knows what people are thinking and feeling and experiencing. And even if he couldn't, John says that Jesus, when he learned about this man's circumstances, it was after he learned about how long he'd been waiting, he goes up to him and asks him, do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? And the man gives this implicit yes that's covered by complaint and explanation. And then Jesus heals him. He doesn't linger. He doesn't address any of it. He just says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Simple. I want to leave you with two thoughts. The first is this. I think as people of God, we need to come back to a certain childlikeness, a certain 
state of being naive in our own hearts and minds, believing that God can heal and restore and transform circumstances. I think that we get a little bit lost in our world and get too accustomed to the state of things that we think this is all there is. And before we even realize it, we treat God like the pool of Bethesda, hoping that he'll touch our hearts and our lives, hoping that we'll get there fast and first. I think we need to return to being like a kid before our heavenly father and just asking, fully trusting and hoping and believing in him that he can answer that, that he can do it. He has the power, he is willing. Do you believe that this morning? Hmm. The second thing that I wanna leave you with is this. Jesus asks him this question, I don't think by accident. I don't think Jesus doesn't know the answer. I think he's testing him a little bit. I think he's checking with this guy to really confirm he wants to be healed. Because when God heals us, when he transforms our lives, when he touches our hearts, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, when we give our lives to Christ and he heals us eternally, we will never be the same again. We can't stay where we are. We can't use these things that, that we used to wear as pain. We can't use them as crutches anymore. We can't live a lesser life because those things don't plague us anymore. He calls us to a higher living with him in our healing. And he is gracious and he is, he is slow and walks with us through that process, yes. But he asks this guy, do you want to get well? Are you sure? Because if you do, if I heal you, your whole life will change. Everything you cling to, everything you find comfort in, the things you run to when you are hurting, you can't go there anymore. You gotta come to me. Would you bow your heads? I'm gonna call our prayer team to come to the front. Uh, if you're a, an elder, pastor, leader, I wanna invite you to come to the front right now. And we're just gonna land like this. We're gonna open up the space for you to come and receive prayer, to stand with someone in the moment of pain that you're in, the season of waiting that you're in. And I hope that you have uh, the vulnerability and the courage this morning to come forward and pray with our team. This is not a concert hall, this is not a convention center, this is a church and we need to treat it like that. Let's participate in ministry. Do not leave this morning if you're in that season without praying with someone. There's nothing magical about it, but it is healing to us. But wherever you are, I just wanna pray over us, especially those who are here and maybe don't have a relationship with Jesus. And maybe as you've gone through this service, you feel him asking you the question, do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed and set free? Do you want a new full life? The invitation is there for you. But you have to be sure you want it because your life will change forever. Let's pray. Jesus, I, I thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you that it is an encouragement to us who are in seasons of waiting. And I lift up my brothers and sisters, my friends to you this morning who don't have a relationship with you, but want one. They feel your spirit hovering over their hearts this morning, calling out to them, inviting them to this new life. I pray right now in Jesus' name, if you're here and that's you, that you would receive Christ into your hearts as you make him the leader of your life. I pray, God, that you would transform each one. 
and help them in that journey. And Father, I ask right now for all of those who are in a season of waiting, for you to bring restoration or healing to touch their lives, God. As we even go through this series, Miracle in the Making, help us, Holy Spirit, to not become discouraged, but guide us and comfort us and bring us peace as we wait upon you, Lord. Help us to go to the places where hurting people are. Help us to last in a season of patience. And Lord, would you transform us as you heal us? In Jesus' name, amen.